subject. I study the French wars of religion and the way the Huguenots wrote about themselves. And one aspect of the way the Huguenots wrote about themselves is, of course, their experience of exile. So tonight I'm going to talk about what they thought about going into exile and how they treated that. And I'm going to use as many examples from Devon and the Channel Islands as possible because that's obviously very relevant. Um, as you'll hear, though, there are very good reasons why Devon doesn't get as many uh, refugees from France as the Southeast. Um, and that's actually an interesting part of the story. Um, as we head into that, though, I am going to um, start sharing with you a very basic set of slides, um, just as something to look at. Uh, and I hope everyone can see that. And I'm just going to shrink that down there. So. I cover um, France from about 1540 up to about 1610 in my third year teaching, and that doesn't often leave France. But the Huguenots themselves are very famous for having left France, particularly in 1685. But as you'll hear, um, they've been doing it for a century almost by that point as well. So we're going to talk about why they left, the ways that that shaped Huguenot identity. I'm going to argue that exile and time away from France is actually central to the way that the Huguenots think about themselves. The way that the Huguenot experience of exile in Geneva in the 1550s actually ends up shaping the English Puritans and particularly the pilgrims who head over um, to America in 1620, which is uh, obviously quite relevant today, this year. And of course, um, the tides that bring them here. There are Huguenot settlements in the 17th century that we're aware of in Barnstaple, Biddeford, two in Exeter, Dartmouth, two in Plymouth, and two in Stonehouse, um, so four in the general Plymouth region. Um, and the ways that that experience is different uh, to the rest of what they call the refuge, so Huguenots in America, Huguenots in Ireland, Huguenots in the Netherlands and Germany. But to do that, of course, we need to start by talking about who are the Huguenots. And, and my argument that I'm, I've been making here, there, and everywhere for the past couple of years is that um, not that many people object to this point of view, but that the Huguenots are, are based around exile, that that is integral to them. The Huguenots are adherents of the French Reformed Church, Protestants in a Catholic country who for a while um, had a legal existence in France and then had that taken away from them. Um, even before we start calling them Huguenot, the idea of exile and escape are central to their story. As early as 1534, when placards denouncing the Catholic Mass were posted across Paris and, and even inside the king's own palace at Blois. Um, a crackdown followed that saw many people burned at the stake for heresy, saw official atonement on the part of the French government, and saw a lot of people, a lot of young Protestants, uh, flee France. And one of them is um, the young Jean Covin, better known to us as John Calvin, um, who ends up very quickly in Geneva, where he's persuaded to stay and help build the church there. This combination of Geneva and Calvin, of, of Calvin in Geneva specifically, isn't incidental. In fact, it's central to the founding of French Protestantism. This is a religion whose leadership were almost entirely exiles themselves, and whose ideas are pretty much being spread uh, from an exile base in Geneva, and then later the Netherlands, the England, and uh, Germany as well. So, like the Puritans, the Presbyterians, the Reformed churches, the Huguenots are um, Protestants who are very biblically based and they're very invested in Calvin's own writings. The Institutes, they advocate for a church that has very few ceremonies, that um, has only two sacraments, that doesn't have bishops, doesn't have much in the way of fancy vestments for their ministers. Um, a, a very, again, the English tradition of this is, is Puritan and, and that filters through into codes of behavior as well. And this becomes a really important point when they move over here. If you want to know why there are two congregations of Huguenots in Exeter or in Plymouth, um, their, their real Puritan leanings are a really important part of that story. Um, and we'll come back to that in, in some time. Um, Geneva becomes a center of learning and a test laboratory for these churches. Um, and, and Calvin's vision is a key part of this influence. And so as Geneva becomes this base for people like Pharrell and Beza and, um, and Calvin himself, it begins to shape a distinctive identity. They become concerned with the, uh, being regarded as serious and godly men, um, that they reject the accusations of the Catholic authorities. We get this 
distinctive Puritan interest in sobriety and manners and dress. You need only look at this picture of Calvin himself to see the sort of thing we mean. The bright colors and annual feasts of Catholic practice disappear. And just like English Puritans, we start seeing new trends in naming. Um, we start seeing fewer clouds or um, Pierre's, and we start seeing a lot more Hezekiah's, Ezekiel's, and Old Testament names appearing amongst them, um, a lot of Abraham's. At the same time, they start printing in huge numbers uh, histories and psalm books out of Geneva, which had become a printing center overnight. Um, refugee printers from England, the Netherlands, and especially France had set up there. And I mention this because these are the texts that I've been using um, as my sources for uh, talks like this one tonight. So this is a French church in exile. Geneva is becoming a French city of refugees, um, but it's not only Frenchmen. Um, in these early years, in this melting pot, we get a lot of British Protestants as well, mainly fleeing Mary Tudor in the 1550s. We get the famously John Knox, who published his, um, his infamous pamphlet, The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women, while he's in Geneva. Miles Coverdale, who would become Bishop of Exeter, um, has some of his formative religious experiences there. And John Bodley, an Exeter merchant, and of course the father of the founder of the Bodleian Library, all go to Geneva during the Marian period. They mix with the Calvinists. Uh, many of them hear sermons by Calvin himself. And at the founding years of the, um, of the English Puritan experience is part of the founding experience of the Huguenots. They, they are literally some of the same people. Um, so exile is, is very common amongst almost all early Protestant groups and provision was made within Geneva for Italian and Spanish communities as well. Um, these were less successful ventures. The Spanish and Italian reformed churches never took off in the way that the Dutch, French and, uh, and English ones did. But we can see here um, the printer that I study printing his, um, his Spanish Psalms in 1557 with a very lazy fake name at the bottom, uh, Pedro Daniel, no such person existed, of course. Um, again, the idea being to provide the, the faithful back in their home countries with the raw materials needed uh, to run their new churches. So in England, this is the form of prayers, the Psalm, and 1560's Geneva Bible. Um, and for 200 years after this date, uh, Puritans would often prefer the Geneva Bible to the later King James edition, seeing it as the more, um, more accurate and indeed more Puritan text there. So this flood of print workers, this flood of refugees, basically are there creating um, the religion in exile. And it's full, of, it's full of Englishmen, it's full of Devonians in some cases, and as well as these, these French nobles doing their work. And so it's in this period, in the 1540s and 50s, that we get the ability to start talking about Huguenots as a distinctive group, not just French Protestants, but French Protestants with an acknowledged philosophy, a style of dress, uh, shared reading materials, and a shared history. We sadly don't actually know what the word Huguenot means. Um, I know that's a very popular question. There are a lot of guesses, including uh, references to the Swiss um, independence fighters, um, and another story about a ghost in the city of Tours, and that's actually considered to be the more likely option is that it's a reference to a ghost story. We don't know what it means, but we know that by 1560, that's what French Protestants are being called. So this is a, an identity and a group who are, who are being formed in exile, and so any discussion of the Huguenots, any discussion of the Puritans, needs to be thinking about exile and talking about exile. This identity gets built up through interaction with Catholic neighbors. It gets built up in exile by bouncing ideas off each other. Um, the English and French martyrologies are published in the same month. Fox and Crespin presumably talked to each other in exile. Um, and it's founded on memory. This idea of exile only works if you keep remembering the home country, if you keep thinking about what is different about where you are. Exile is implicitly based on not being at home. So these books are a really important way to think about it. And here's Crespin's um, 1563 edition of his Livre de Martyr, his Book of Martyrs. And it's just, if you know Fox and his Book of Martyrs, it's exactly the same idea. And this is important because in the context of the 1560s um, and 70s, which are full of wars and peace treaties, um, they're constantly being encouraged to forgive and especially to forget. So the way you become a Huguenot in some parts is by holding a grudge, by remembering, by sticking with these 
um, ideas and these identities and not becoming one big happy family again at the end of each war. Um, and it's this sort of identity building that becomes the reason why you might want to leave France rather than to stay. So we've long argued that Joan Fox and his Book of Martyrs are absolutely key to creating an English sense of national identity. For the Huguenots, it's the Livre des Martyrs that you see here doing the exact same thing. And if your business was martyrdom, like Crespens was, the business was good in the 1540s and 50s. There were a lot of executions happening. There was a lot of persecution. And therefore, there were a lot of people leaving. These martyrologies can also tell us a lot about how people felt, as I've already noted. And the first thing to note is really that um, very few of these people saw exile as suffering. Some did. Um, the Marian English exile, Rose Throck Morton, saw it as a form of martyrdom. But it generally wasn't seen as suffering. Instead, exile was seen as a form of uh, potential self-improvement. Certainly Geneva was talked a lot about that way. Um, Geneva is always being described as, um, to use a common phrase, a city on a hill, as an example to others, as a place you go to become a better Protestant, a place you can go to learn about the religion. Um, Crespin is always writing about how God has protected the city of Geneva against all the dangers around it. Um, it's a uh, a tutor to the poor faithful chased from all parts out of their country who dedicated this city to God's name. Um, Geneva is a laboratory, a perfect school of Christ in the name, in the words rather, of uh, the Scottish reformer John Knox. And this carries on for a long time. It's these phrases and ideas that carry through to the Brownist separatists who in the 1620s go off to New England and in the 1630s the English Puritans uh, creating New England, again, are using this idea of a city on a hill, an example to others. Um, so there's a common thread uh, that we can identify here between what's going on in Geneva in this period and what will happen in the founding of America later. There are examples of communities admitting that they've left France um, under duress. The Vaudois of Provence, who were attacked in 1545 by French and papal armed forces. And again, yes, the, the Pope has an army in this period. Um, operating out of Avignon inside of the French borders. Um, they massacre these Vaudois, and then the survivors beg that they be allowed to leave for the cities and country of Germany, where there are churches according to the doctrine of the gospel in which they wish to live. So this request to be allowed to go and to live under their own circumstances. And the, the fact that they're not being allowed to go is presented as an act of cruelty alongside the actual massacre. So exile is almost a human right for people in this period. The idea that you can go and pursue your own religious aims is something that is almost expected in this period. And it's towards the 1560s as these wars are breaking out that we start seeing the first Protestant congregations popping up along the south coast of England. Um, and, and that's what's important to, to recognize is that there are some of many. There are French congregations appearing in the Netherlands, um, especially in Germany and in Switzerland. But now we're seeing them in London, in Threadneedle Street, uh, in Rye, in Sandwich, in Norwich, in Colchester, and even in um, the heart of uh, the crypt of Canterbury Cathedral. And to this day, there is a French Reformed Church operating out of uh, England's central cathedral. Um, it only has one service a month now, but it is there, and it remains there. These churches were formed under, under Edward VI. They were doubly exiled under Mary I, and they come back under Elizabeth. And during this period, they don't have to obey the Anglican Church's rules exactly. Even though they're operating out of Canterbury Cathedral, some of them, they are able to follow a more Puritan line. And this causes a lot of tension at a time when the Anglican Church is trying to crack down on Puritanism you have these foreign Protestant communities in the heart of London, the heart of Canterbury, and all along the South Coast, um, basically acting as a Trojan horse and bringing Calvinist ideas into London, invalidating the Elizabethan settlement. Now, some of these churches still survive. What you see here is the 19th century Huguenot church in London, the Soho Square Church, which has this tympanium uh, 1950s, uh, repairing bomb damage, again, depicting the whole Huguenot experience, which is depicted as exile, finding security over here in England, um, with that Huguenot logo symbol uh, front and center at the top. 
So some of these institutions survived from 1550s right up to today, although none that I'm aware of in Devon as early as that. There was briefly a settlement in Glastonbury attempting to uh, leverage Huguenot expertise in weaving and create an industrial center in the West Country. Um, it didn't last very long that I'm aware of. The other part of this region that sees very early Huguenot settlement are the Channel Islands. Being so close off the coast of, um, of Normandy in particular, uh, there's constant coming and going of Huguenots there as a French speaking community that is now having to operate under Protestant religion, the authorities in Guernsey and Jersey in particular are absolutely desperate to get their hands on Huguenot refugee ministers just so they can put them to work because otherwise there's no one who is both Protestant and French speaking to operate their churches. And so we see an awful lot of refugees turning up in, in Guernsey, in Jersey, but then annoyingly for them leaving again. Um, which is, is something that we see quite a bit. So in this period, we have this idea developing of the Huguenots as representing a more refined, a less compromised version of Protestantism than the Elizabethan settlement allows for. Um, that the growth of Puritanism in England can be dated to this period has been argued for a long time, from Patrick Collinson at least. Um, and that the stranger churches, the Dutch and French churches in London, are there fueling it. From 1560, the French church is organized by Nicolas de Galard, who is a French nobleman who has spent time in Geneva. The links are very strong indeed. Now, these exiles are always wanting to head home. They're very interested in heading home, and they use England and they use Switzerland as a, um, as a headquarters to print propaganda and ship it secretly into France, to train ministers and send them into France. And as I've already said, we have Spanish, English, Italian, and German communities in Geneva and later in London operating and producing this propaganda, educating these ministers and sending them back. So these trained Calvinist ministers from Geneva are smuggled back into France under false names. They are founding their own churches. And by 1559, the French Reformed Church claims to have 1,200 congregations and 2 million followers. Probably an exaggeration, but that would mean that one in every 10 Frenchmen in this period was a Protestant. And they tended to cluster, and this is very important for understanding why Huguenots do and do not end up in Devon, they tend to cluster in the south. If you look at this map of, um, of France here, you can see the real clusters is, is what we call the Huguenot Crescent, stretching from the Genevan border um, near uh, Grenoble, in a big arc down past Nîmes and Avignon and Toulouse, back up to La Rochelle on the Atlantic coast. 90% of Protestant churches can be found in that sort of suite, but you will notice that there are some clustered up and down the Loire Valley and a bunch in Normandy around Rouen. And it's the groups in Rouen who are always coming and going to England. If you're trying to flee from near Grenoble, you'll just head to Germany or Switzerland. But if you live in La Rochelle or you live in Rouen, England becomes your nearest or easiest Protestant place of safety. And so this demographic sort of layout is really important here. If these numbers are true, if one in 10 French people is a Huguenot, perhaps one in two, perhaps 50% of the French nobility were Protestant by this period. These are men with, with weapons, with money, and with political influence who, who are in some ways above the law and who are sheltering illegal Protestant churches in their castles, on their property. And it's this tension in France that leads by 1562 to the outbreak of the French Wars of Religion, which are pretty much a consistent period of warfare, um, low level warfare for the most part, um, very few pitched battles, but on and off wars lasting for the next 35 years. Um, there are eight to 10, depending on how you count them, separate wars of religion in this period. We see multiple kings of France die young or are assassinated, princes of Condé killed, dukes of Guise, um, in a series of wars, assassinations, and eventually just outright vendettas that end up having very little to do with religion by the end of it. The pieces that punctuate, that separate these wars, um, give and take away Huguenot rights, though. By the midpoint of these wars, the Huguenots are increasingly being accepted as a legal, if inferior group of citizens in France. Um, they have the right to operate their own churches legally in France, 
but we've also seen perhaps half of them convert back to Catholicism or leave the country. The key point for this, the key moment for this is 1572's massacre um, of St. Bartholomew's Day, where a royal wedding between um, the king's sister and the leader of the Huguenots, the uh, King de Navarre, um, later Henri IV of France, a day after the wedding, um, with all the Protestant leadership and nobility into town, it turns into an absolute slaughter in the streets of Paris, as you can see. Um, and there have been debates ever since then about to what degree this was an ambush, to what degree the whole wedding was a trap, the degree to which this was something the Catholics wanted. But the event shocked Europe, particularly Protestant Europe. Um, supposedly, the, well, the Catholics found it a very different thing. You'll, you'll find a representation of this massacre painted in the Vatican to this day, and um, supposedly it's the only time that uh, Philip II of Spain ever laughed, was, was finding out about this. Um, in England, it becomes a central part of the mythology. The word massacre enters the English language as a result of this. It's the French word for, for butchery. It becomes part of the English language at this point, um, and it becomes part of our collective memory. Um, Christopher Marlowe's play, Massacre at Paris, is obviously about this. Um, Group, a series of artworks comes in, but also increased support in England, across England, for these French refugees. And we get a lot of them in this country, um, but so do the Dutch, so do the Swiss. The London church ends up having to add another service in 1572. The Dutch refused to share their church, and by the beginning of 1573, the poor box is paying out seven times as much as it had five years earlier. The English authorities, the English government, Gray's Inn, and the Merchant Tailors Company all chip in money to uh, cover their costs as a result of this. Sixty or more ministers have fled France to England in this period. Um, very little employment could be found for them. Um, they're told to, to learn a trade, and they complain about that. They want to keep being ministers. Um, and they, we, we know from their writings, though, that even at this peak of violence, they believe that this exile is going to be temporary. They're only going to be in England for a short period of time. Some of these ministers do take up jobs in England, but they agree that it will only be on a short-term basis. In Guernsey, for example, we see six vacant parishes being taken, it being agreed that their appointment shall not hinder their returning to their own churches on the continent, if God permit. And that's a very, very optimistic way of thinking at this point in the wars. It's very clear that they had a very tough time of it in this period. Um, Andrew Pedigree tells us that a usurer in the play The Three Ladies of London advises one of um, the local landlords to rent her properties out to foreigners because they can be squeezed in several to a room. And the, the London mob is not always paying attention to who's Protestant or not, and French refugees are often attacked because they are French. Um, little excuse seems to be needed there. It's only really after the accession of Henri IV that we see the, um, the back and forth of refugees to England start to dry up. From 1598, Henri has begun to bring in lasting peace in France, the Edict of Nantes, which is a very important landmark here. Um, brings together a lot of the previous peace treaties. It's not a utopian grant of tolerance and freedom, but instead balances a series of incentives, a lot of rights, but also restrictions. No French. Protestants are allowed to worship within Paris, for example. Um, and under this edict, the Huguenots enjoy an 87-year period of official toleration within France. They develop their own institutions in this time. The Huguenots become particularly well-known in business and manufacturing. Um, they particularly become well-known as uh, leading French generals and uh, military engineers. Um, they, be, they build up strong connections to Protestant Germany. Um, Paracelsian medicine, which is, is particularly Protestant brand of medicine, becomes very in vogue with all its, its drugs and its treatments. That's taught at the Protestant University of Montpellier, and having a Protestant doctor becomes a, a sign of status within France in the 17th century. And so when the Huguenots do flee France again, as I'll come to shortly, it's the skilled workers and craftsmen who are able to flee. The Huguenot reputation for thrift and industry comes from the fact that they, they already represented a very large middle class in France by the time that this happened. But from the 1620s, Louis XIII and his advisor, uh, the Cardinal Richelieu, had begun to reduce Huguenot independence, begun to besiege and take their, their smaller independent towns, 
reduce their independent power base within France. And this reaches a climax in the 14-month siege of La Rochelle, um, immortalized here much later in 1881 image. And this is one in which England is, is heavily implicated. Um, the Duke of Buckingham was sent with a large force to try and uh, save La Rochelle and, and failed miserably. His assassination followed that shortly. The Huguenots at this point are building a reputation for being suspicious of royal authority, suspicious of absolutism, and that's a tradition that in the 17th century carries on in England too. The Protestant, the French Protestant communities in London side with Parliament and not the King during the English Civil Wars for the most part. Uh, because they find Charles too Catholic, they, they find the more radical Protestantism that a lot of the parliamentarians represent far more to their liking. The, the French Protestants are, are very clear that they are associated with Puritanism in a lot of ways. And so with the Huguenot power diminished after Richelieu's actions, after the 1620s, France officially starts working on winning the Protestants back to Catholicism. Official tax breaks and incentives are provided for new converts, and slowly Huguenot numbers in France drop. And this is proof to a lot of Huguenots that it's only by bribery that they can be defeated. They can't be won over by better arguments. The process accelerates when Louis XIV accedes to the throne. Um, he's a king who takes his religion seriously. He resents the independence of the Huguenots. And he's frequently at war with Protestant powers. By the 1680s, the government is pressuring Protestants without breaking the rules of the Edict of Nantes explicitly through something called the Dragonade quartering troops, dragoons, uh, two or three to a household and making them responsible for paying for these upkeeps um, and, and making Catholics exempt from that. This can bankrupt almost any family in a matter of months, if not weeks. Um, and families are thus being given a choice between conversion and total ruin. Louis is constantly justifying his actions in these regards by telling the world how much worse English Catholics have it. And so uh, a propaganda war is here. And this is one of these pieces of uh, French Protestant propaganda showing a French soldier forcing a conversion here by what they sarcastically refer to as invincible reason. As you'll notice that musket is labeled. Um, he's a dragoon and a missionary. They're joking. And then to the side, it says that force surpasses reason. And they see their religion as reasonable. They see the Catholic faith as superstitious. So by the 1680s, it's clear that Protestantism's days in France are numbered. Those who could leave have started to do so. The Huguenot churches that already exist in London and Amsterdam uh, quadruple in this period. And in 1685, with the Edict of Fontainebleau, the Edict of Nantes is formally revoked, banning the Huguenot religion. The, their temples, their schools are to be destroyed, they're to lose their civic rights, and they're not even to be allowed to leave the country if they wish. Ministers have to go, but the regular Protestants of France are not to be given that option. And again, this is completely contrary to accepted practice. Austria has kicked out its Protestants. Various parts of Germany have eliminated their religious minorities, but they've always allowed them safe passage to a country that does practice their religion. So France is seen as particularly overbearing in this. Shocking, indeed. And most Huguenots do not emigrate. They can't. They, most of them don't have the kind of the money or the contacts to do so. The ones who do come, particularly to England, are those with either money or contacts who can get them out of the country. Plenty of them convert in name only. They lie low, they have their services in secret, they have um, an underground church that survives until the revolution when Protestantism is legal again. Um, in the south, in the Cévennes region of France, we see just what they call the Church of the Desert, which just defies authority, wages a decade-long guerrilla war against the French state and, and practices their own form of Protestantism uh, there. So in a lot of ways, the Huguenots never leave France. The bulk of them don't. We, however, are most familiar with those who are lucky enough and firm enough in their faith to escape, and the word they like to use is retire or retreat abroad into what they call la refuge, 
And this is the other word the Huguenots give us is that of refugee. And it tells you everything you need to know about Huguenot history if you know that the two words they give English are massacre and refugee, really. Um, hundreds of thousands take this up. Where they go is dictated by the logic of expediency as they head to the most accessible Protestant state. This is dictated by existing family or business contacts and economy in need of their skills. This is a hugely expensive and dangerous trip. Guides across the frontier can double cross you. The Swiss border towns are, are heaving and full of disease at this point. Plenty are following the old refugee trails to Geneva and then onwards to a Germany that's still recovering from the Thirty Years' War. Prussia Brandenburg is explicitly in the business of trying to recruit Huguenot refugees. Um, it's still depopulated after the Thirty Years' War. Their industry relies on these immigrants. And Berlin, at the turn of the 18th century, is 20% made up of French-speaking Protestants. They build this, what they call the French Cathedral, Franziska Dom in Berlin, which is still there um, to this day on the Gendarmenplatz. The great elector is so keen to have Huguenots come to Berlin that he establishes offices along the French border to greet the arriving refugees and pay their fare onwards to his territories, openly recruiting for more refugees. The Huguenots revolutionize industry and agriculture there, and they're given special rights to tempt them in. They're given their own laws. They're allowed to keep speaking French. There are law courts, freedom from customs. Um, they're a sought after demographic. And so our perception of the Huguenots is founded on these industrious and wealthy ones who end up coming over the border. And this, this damages the French economy badly. Lyon loses three quarters of its professional silk weavers who end up in Germany and the Netherlands. The hat making industry in Normandy falls apart so badly that supposedly Catholic cardinals are buying their red hats from Huguenots living in Wandsworth in this period where there's still a Huguenot graveyard to this day. Those from Nîmes leave and they bring with them their special serge cloth, the cloth de Nîmes, which we now know as denim, and start selling that abroad from the Netherlands. Um, perhaps 20% of those who come to Germany are agricultural workers, um, and they end up in Germany or in South Africa, having first gone to the Netherlands. Um, there's a lot of Huguenot names amongst the boards of South Africa to this day. There's one colony of French Huguenot uh, farmers in North Devon, just outside Barnstable, and I have no idea where they got their land from. I don't know how they achieved that, but they did. Now, the Netherlands is the most popular destination. The Huguenots often refer to it as the Great Ark. Um, it's very easy to get to. You don't need a boat. I have familiar links there. And 36 Huguenot churches open up there in the immediate aftermath of the revocation. And there are churches like this all over the world, in South Africa, in London, in America, that come up. Now, England is a different proposition. With England, there are strong trade links, but those are necessarily by ship. And so escape would have to be by ship, too. Fewer people are able to attempt it. Some do so at extreme risk to their lives. Small boats. Um, full of 40 or 50 people turn up in Plymouth Sound in early, early on in the 1680s and 1681 with about 40 or 50 people aboard. The revocation hasn't even happened. That same week, others arrive in Dartmouth and in Exeter and are taken aboard. Um, these, are, these are not proper channel crossing vessels. We don't know if any ships like this were lost in the crossing. As with those who left France by road, the Huguenots had a logic here. They're generally either fishermen or people who were able to get um, merchant contacts they knew to smuggle them out of France. Now, if you look at that Huguenot crescent I was showing, you can see why Devon did not become a major center for such refugees, despite being on the south coast. Brittany, in particular, was a very conservative Catholic stronghold. Um, and if you are in Normandy, the Channel Islands become a major haven. But for them, Southampton is the major port in these years. Instead, the Huguenots of Devon aren't coming from the north coast of France. They're coming from its west coast. They're coming from its Atlantic coast. I'm just going to flat back up there. Virtually all the Huguenot refugees whose origins we can identify are coming from the middle of that Atlantic coast around La Rochelle, the region called the Zantong. There are trade links there. Um, and this is a route. They're heading either to Devon or to Bristol. These are familiar territory for some of them. This has been the effect of capital of the Huguenot world in the 17th century. 
Jacques Fontaine, who's probably one of the best known, the most famous Huguenot refugees, comes from this region. He landed in Appledore. He settled in Barnstable for a while and then Taunton. Uh, Nicolas Aubin also came from the Zantong, and he became the second minister of the French church in Exeter, which for decades was given the use of St. Olaf's Church on 4th Street, which many of you will probably know. Um, you can still see his gravestone there today. Uh, it's by the, um, the front wall, the west wall of the church, and um, it's almost impossible to get a good photograph of, but there it is. Uh, Plymouth's first conformist French minister also came from the Zantong, Monsieur Gomarc of Verteuil, um, and along with him came five or six new ships who all registered in the fishing fleet and the merchant fleets at Stonehouse in 1686, the year after revocation. So we get a very specific group here. And these are largely people who would have known each other, who would have had some links already with Plymouth, with Exeter. Um, they tend to be seafaring groups already. That makes them a bit different from your average London Huguenot, for example. Now these people are given a complicated mix of, of welcomes and restrictions. We know from the municipal records um, that these early boats of refugees were given money and lodging in 1682 and 1684. Um, refugees to England, if they got here though, were not guaranteed citizenship um, in the same way that Berlin or the Netherlands were offering them citizenship. And so a number of them came here and then moved on. Um, the reception reflected local tensions in England. Um, the Huguenots were generally accepted as they were Protestants. They were seen with some suspicion in some quarters because they were French. It was thought that they might be uh, secret agents. But generally speaking, the ground level reception was very good. Fontaine, when he and his shipmates, several dozen of them, arrive in Appledore, were taken in immediately by local families. And in his words, God provided us fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, among strangers. Um, his host in Barnstable, who's a wealthy man called Mr. Down, goes into business with Fontaine within Fontaine's first week there. Um, other members of that ship are uh, married soon after arriving in Devon, and they are given, the whole wedding is organized by the local community. We, we pay for everything, lend them their houses, and so on. They put together the wedding banquet. For some considerable time, the Huguenot refugees in particularly North Devon and Plymouth are being given charity at a local level and they're being supported with funds raised by the parish collection, so voluntary donations by the uh, average people, but also by the civil list, government money is coming in. There is a catch though, and that is that um, the rights of foreign nonconformists to worship in their own way, um, there were real restrictions there under James II. Uh, Marie de Rochefoucauld, who has come from La Rochelle, landed at Exeter in 1687 um, via Dartmouth and almost immediately left again for the Low Countries where she felt more secure. She didn't trust James. She felt he was um, too Catholic for her taste. And um, if she had come a year later after James had issued his declaration of indulgence, she might have been happier. But the initial situation in England in those first few years was one that made a lot of Huguenots deeply wary. Even after James has issued his Declaration of Indulgence, even after James has been deposed, and the Huguenots play a role in that, state aid is only available to Huguenots who join the Church of England. They, accept, they have to accept bishops if they do so, and they have to follow the Book of Common Prayer, although translated into French. Now, many do, probably a majority do, um, out of the need for that state support. Um, those who do seem to be doing so on the basis, too, that compromises will need to be made because their exile here is going to be permanent. In Devon, this meant that uh, Nicola Aubin's Exeter congregation received welfare payments, but also, as I've already mentioned, the use of St. Olaf's Church. And they, they kept using that for about 70 years, well into the middle of the 18th century. In Plymouth, there are about 230 members of the conformist congregation here who joined the Church of England. They get the use of St. Andrew's Church, and we believe they also used the Blackfriars Building, the current home of Plymouth Gin. The records are a bit sketchy on that, but that would appear to be where they were based as well. Eventually, they end up building themselves a new church building in Howes Lane, uh, which they eventually rented out to the Baptists. And this, this appears to have been a very distinctive building with a gallery and all sorts of balconies, multiple levels of seats. In Barnstable, it was St. Anne's Chapel, now an art center that served the Huguenot community. And these are all dwarfed by the congregation just over at Stonehouse on the, uh, the peninsula leading down to what is now the Royal William Yard, 
that may have had 600 members in uh, 1692, and probably a settled population who stayed on of about 350. This congregation drew on Church of England support, and they got the use of St. George's Chapel, the top of Durnford Street, and that's that's gone now, um, but it's now that Citroën dealership right at the top of Durnford Street, if you know the area. Um, like the Plymouth congregation, they end up renting uh, their building out as their congregation declined. So Plymouth in this area, in this time, as well as Exeter, are giving over large church and city-owned properties for the use of these refugees. Um, 230 people using St. Andrews every Sunday, 600 perhaps on the Durnford Peninsula. These are substantial groups of people. And they're not the only ones because conformism isn't for everyone. Many, like Jacques Fontaine, who I've mentioned already, uh, felt that this is too close to coercion, that this is a compromise they are not willing to make. Um, he eventually, Fontaine, moves to Ireland uh, to found his own congregation there. Um, and they form independent groups along the same lines of the Baptists or Presbyterians or even Quaker groups who are forming in England in this period. They operate without bishops, um, without government support, and that's obviously financially more difficult for them. And this can cause real ruptures. So there end up being two congregations in Exeter, two congregations in Plymouth, a conformist and a non-conformist one. In Kent, one congregation of Huguenots are so appalled by their ministers joining the Church of England that they end up walking a dozen miles each way to and from Canterbury every week in order to hear the non-conformist services there, abandoning him almost alone in their church. So these small populations of Huguenot refugees end up splintering into these conformist and non-conformist groups. In Soho, we end up with about a dozen churches, um, mostly conformist. They've got strong links with the establishment. They do a lot of luxury work. They seem to be more comfortable joining the Church of England. The same seems to be true of Exeter. However, in weaving communities who don't have much contact with society outside them, non-conformist groups dominate. And so um, Brick Lane, Whitechapel area, is full of non-conformist Huguenot churches, literally dozens of them. Plymouth and Stonehouse have that as well. And in 1689, they found their own church. We don't know exactly where, but it was very near to Frankfurt Gate. So uh, not quite where the current Frankfurt Gate is, a bit closer to the Guildhall building, um, that has three ministers serving it. So it must have been very large indeed. Like the nonconformists of elsewhere, they find themselves physically on the fringes of the adopted community without the use of the churches that the conformist members have. Um, but they seem to have stuck around longer. It was still going in 1762. Alison Grant and Robin Gwynn, who are the, the key people who've studied these congregations, reckon that it might have had as many as 450 settled members, more than either conformist congregation. The appeal of this, of their native order of service, of not making any compromises after going to the great lengths of, of going into exile, really has to be considered here. So we have in Plymouth at least three Huguenot congregations, which make up one of the largest Huguenot populations in England when co considered as a collective. And then just along the coast, there's another one in Dartmouth and several in Exeter. Perhaps 10% of the population of uh, Plymouth more generally may have been Huguenots in those early years. And so what did they do? In Spitalfields or in Exeter, they entered the luxury trades, as I'll mention in a minute. In Plymouth and Stonehouse, there's less of a market for that. Those with skills in a specific craft have gone to London or to Exeter or to Bristol. Plymouth, along with Dartmouth, um, gets a lot of merchants, a lot of ship owners and other maritime sorts, particularly fishermen, people who just can't move inland. Um, there are a number of people who have the connections and capacity to make the trip here, um, but they're, they're more likely to stay. We know of only one silversmith. It's kind of the archetypal Huguenot job. Jean Bonté is known to have worked in Plymouth. However, a number of ships are registered to Stonehouse and become English vessels. They seem to have been 20 to 80 tons capacity, and you can tell they're Huguenot by the names they have. They've got Old Testament, Puritan names, Hope, Judith, King David, Moses, and they take colonists to the Puritan colonies in New England, and um, as well as Virginia and Carolina. And they do a triangular trade with France, um, bringing cloth to there, bringing oranges and brandy from France to England um, and, and shipping goods around, making use of their French contacts. Many more, of course, are not so lucky as to arrive with their own ship. 
um, many end up needing state aid, as we've seen, and the government sets aside special money for this. We know that many open shops, and in um, Plymouth in 1701, we've got a French wig maker, a French confectioner, and a French tailor, and he's advertising himself, all of them are actually, as specifically French. You can get the latest fashions from the French tailor in a way that you can't from your local English one. We know this, though, mainly because their minister, Monsieur de Joux, has to write to London asking for help for these businessmen who they felt were being persecuted by the local merchants who did not appreciate the competition. When Jacques Fontaine moves to Taunton in Somerset, he also gets shut out from the community at first. He's accused of being a secret Catholic. When he becomes successful, he's accused of taking bread from the mouths of the English um, and accused of being, and this is, this is a quote from the time, as rich as a Jew. He's seen as, as an outsider despite being a settled Protestant. Fontaine, as I've mentioned, left for England. His family moves to America later. Um, and there is a bit of a backlash as the Huguenots become more settled, as it becomes clear that they're staying. Uh, the MP for Bristol in this period, um, appalled by what he calls a fear of frogs in abundance, um, argued in Parliament for kicking the foreigners out, although he was not supported in that. Instead, the real advances get made by the Huguenots in the textile industry. Um, you've got these huge weaving shops in Brick Lane. If you've ever walked around Whitechapel and seen those distinctive Georgian terraces with the glassed-in upper stories, those are largely built by Huguenot entrepreneurs. Um, and Fontaine and others like him really revolutionize the trade. They invent new forms of cloth, which within a generation of forming the majority of England's exports to the continent. Um, in Devon, we see a lot of work in furniture, clock making, silversmithing, paper, and print. We see tapestry works for the first time in, well, just about the first time in Devon, and they're all being run by Huguenots. Um, Cloud Passavant's famous carpet weaving operation moves wholesale down to Exeter in the 1750s, and the family developed the Friars area near Southgate. If you've ever um, been around there, a lot of those buildings are of Huguenot construction. John Channon, who um, does the bookcases within Powderham Castle, is also believed to be a Huguenot uh, descent, and, and again have brought the doing the brass inlay into those um, into that wood is is a particularly difficult task that he was apparently a bit of a specialist in. So the Huguenots are providing more than just competition; they're introducing new and stronger links to the rest of Europe. They're bringing places like Plymouth into the European mainstream. Plymouth gets its first newspaper being published by Huguenot, Monsieur Jourdain, um, and generally teaching languages, providing trade, um, and so on. We know that there's a link between industry and conformity here. The, the groups that kept themselves apart and worked on their own trade took a much longer time to fit in. The Stonehouse congregation of nonconformists um, seems to have lasted until 1807. Uh, the Exeter Conformist group, however, disappears by 1755. These groups are already members of the Church of England, and so once their members grow up speaking English, they kind of lose their reason for being. This has made them hard to follow through the records. They start appearing in our history records as, um, as just regular citizens. If he didn't appear in the church registers, we'd have no reason to think that the Mark Quinlan we see in 1735 had been born a Huguenot. And so over time, Monsieur Jourdain's family become uh, Mr. Jordan, the Benois become Benedicts or Bennets, um, and some refugees even translate their names. Monsieur Loiseau becomes Mr. Bird. And so very quickly, a lot of our knowledge of the Huguenots vanishes. We, we, they, they blend into the community within two generations, and uh, it becomes difficult to track them. We know that many of these marriages were, were made here, not just between English and French refugees, but between French refugees from different parts of France who were meeting in England for the first time. There was such a marriage in 1697 in Stonehouse. So the nonconformists take a little longer, effectively, to blend in. They, even once they grow up speaking English, even once you're onto the grandchildren of the first refugees, they still have their separate churches, their separate communities. They last a little longer. Their records can be hard to find, um, but it, it is generally into the 19th century before these groups start to disappear. Um, and the simple fact is they haven't all disappeared. The Huguenots established a lot of organizations for themselves. We see um, the French hospital 
founded in central London to look after the Huguenot poor, um, eventually moves out to Rochester, where there is a Huguenot museum, but also almshouses for aged um, people of Huguenot descent to live in today. They operate a food charity, La Soupe, and a charity school in Westminster that survived well into the 20th century. Um, the 19th century also sees, just as these groups are starting to become more ceremonial than real, the foundation of the Huguenot Society, um, which has its own library, a scholarly journal, it prints sources and sponsors an awful lot of work. So in the 19th century in Berlin and London in Amsterdam, we see the final throes of the Huguenots as an independent religious group, but they start founding institutions like the Huguenot Society, like the French Hospital, and so on, that very much do last until today. Um, and so they fade away. There's a lot of French names associated with them. They never entirely leave. A lot of these institutions are very considerable. Um, and of course, the impact that this experience of exile has, as I've argued, kind of seeps into the coming of, of William III, which I could talk an awful lot more about, um, who lands in Devon, part of a Protestant putsch, a Protestant coup. Um, and Huguenots fight by the side of William at great length. They also influence, as we've seen, Puritanism and also Puritan exile to New England in the early 17th century and really shape a lot of English resistance to the French and Spanish Catholicism in the late 16th century. There's a strong Huguenot element in the uh, English resistance to the Spanish Armada, for example, um, that I can go into in more detail. So. The Huguenots in Devon are, are not the main affair, but they're a very distinctive side group, mainly from La Rochelle, mainly getting interested in the crafts, and, and lasting here probably a lot longer than, than we're used to thinking about. And um, for time reasons, I think I'll probably stop uh, right about there. Thank you very much.